Uh, it's a new year. Well, sorry, guys. I didn't mean to awe on that. I'm feeling very, very rusty <laughs> no, here. It's okay. We're very rusty. May I recommend some extra coal medicine? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my kids couldn't believe, like, oh, you have to go back to doing the podcast again? Yeah. <laughs> From New York Times Opinion, I'm Lydia Polgreen. I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Ross Douthat. And I'm Carlos Lozada. And this is Matter of Opinion. It's a new year, and it's a big one because we're in an election year that's already consuming headlines and, to be honest, also consuming this podcast. <laughs> Alas. Colorado Supreme Court and Maine's Secretary of State ruled recently that Trump is ineligible to be on the ballot, joining 30-something states that have lodged some form of challenge to Trump's eligibility. Ultimately, this will almost certainly land at the Supreme Court, which will have to deliver some kind of definitive verdict. Unsurprisingly, not everyone agrees on the constitutional ground in these cases are based on, which we'll get into, and I have a feeling we don't all agree amongst ourselves either, which will be really, really fun to talk about. Okay, so, guys, in one sentence, what's uh, the most significant thing about these cases that you want to talk about today? Um, I have been watching America's finest constitutional minds go back and forth on this, so I'm not looking to solve the legal matter today. What I want to know is whether the Supreme Court is going to make this better or worse when they rule. Hmm. That was actually the same thing that I wanted to <laughs> raise. And not just whether they strike it down or uphold it, but how they do it, whether they do so broadly or narrowly or unanimously or on partisan grounds, I think will make a huge difference in how it is received. Interesting. Ross, how about you? I don't know. I feel like my views on this are so predictable that I'm trying to come up with something unpredictable to say. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of these efforts. I think it would be great if we had a presidential election where we just had secretaries of state sort of deciding, like, maybe the secretary of state of Wisconsin could put me on the ballot, for instance. That would be, <laughs> that would, that would be good. Be I think I would do well in crucial... Waukesha uh, County? Crucial, well, tr <laughs> crucial Waukesha <laughs> County. Wow I don't know. I mean, it was just a couple podcasts ago, in fact, that we were talking about threats to democracy and someone was talking about the way that authoritarian-ish political parties conspire to keep their opponents off the ballot. And I made some sort of joke about, you know, how oh, wouldn't it be terrible if someone was trying to keep a candidate, a popular candidate off the ballot? And I, I seem to recall everyone else sort of howling me down and saying, oh, that's just a bunch of nerds speculating on Twitter. And now it's not a bunch of nerds speculating on Twitter. It's the great state of Colorado and the great state. Your, your beloved state of my Maine. My beloved state of oh, Maine, my ancestral <laughs> state of Maine. So, you know, I, I, I'm I not surprised by any of this. Ross, I, I get I, it. You're, you're pro-choice. You don't want I'm, some judge in Colorado or Maine telling you what to do with your body politic. <laughs> so I respect that. I respect that. I mean, I, I, I don't even know how to begin to respond to that, <laughs> yeah. Sally. Carlos, I mean, here's sort of a big picture. A deeper question here is just, do you think that the challenge to American democracy is just all about Donald Trump himself alone, this one guy, this distinctive figure, this reality TV show, proto-fascist, billionaire, whatever, and if we can just make him go away, things will go back to normal? Do you think that? Because if you think that, then I can see how you start to talk yourself into the idea that this is a good idea, and you say to yourself, look, I'm sure that a majority of the Republicans on the Supreme Court do not want Donald Trump to be president again. So why shouldn't they just wave a magic wand and get rid of him? Nikki Haley can run the table, or maybe DeSantis could make a comeback. One of them will beat Donald Trump. Everything will go back to normal. And, you know, that's sort of a view that I had for the first year or so of the Trump phenomenon. And I think you know, I, I don't I guess I don't understand how at this point with everything we've seen in Europe, in North America, around the world, that you could think of Trump as just sort of a force that you can just make go away and everything will go back to normal. But clearly there are people who think that. So that's yeah. what I'm interested in, I guess. Having again, having thought that once myself. 
Yeah. Well, you've clearly been on a journey here with this, Ross, and I It's a I long journey. You, I'm I sorry. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a lot. I mean, for me, I think the thing that I'm sort of interested to watch how everyone is going to embrace and abandon their priors as the situation matches their political needs in this moment. I think that uh, that will reveal a lot about our body politic, which, uh, you know, I'm very pro-choice, so not an issue for me. But but first, like, let's let's just kind of talk through uh, a little bit these cases. Does anyone want to kind of make the case for the 14th Amendment interpretation that, that Trump shouldn't be on the ballot? Does anyone want to take that on as a thing that they would uh, would argue for? Can't be you, Ross. It can be it can be me. Why not? The strongest argument is that the text of the Constitution is clear that you cannot hold high public office and the presidency, it should be said, is not specified. But let's assume that it's encompassed uh, if you have launched an insurrection or rebellion against the United States of America. This applied to Jefferson Davis and former Confederates. It applies, it should be stressed, if you have already taken an oath to the Constitution. So, you know, you have to have held a significant office already, but Donald Trump clearly held a significant office. And if you believe that the events of the 6th of January are actually an insurrection in the manner envisioned by people trying to exclude ex-Confederates from political office in the United States, then it's sort of an open and shut case, right? Yeah, I mean, and that's the argument that has been made by conservative legal scholars. So what's wrong with that argument? Why not run with it? Carlos, do you have a, a counter to it? No, I mean, I'm, I'm torn. So, Ross, you wrote a column about this recently, and you cited, I think, um, Jonathan Chait's argument that, you know, calling... January 6th, an insurrection is a defensible shorthand, maybe in a journalistic sense, but is not really what happened. Um, he says Trump attempted to secure an unelected second term. He didn't try to like seize and hold the Capitol or declare a breakaway republic. Just because the 14th Amendment was created in the aftermath of the Civil War with Confederate officers in mind does not mean that any violation of the amendment must necessarily rise to the level of Confederate secessionism to trigger the amendment. I don't think that's how laws work. Laws against murder don't mean that the murder has to be committed just the way like Cain killed Abel or something. <laughs> that's a deep cut. You don't, that's a deep you don't, cut. You don't, you don't have to be Charles Ponzi to sort of commit financial fraud. Mm -hmm. And to me, what the notion that, you know, this, this shouldn't apply, that it's not really insurrection bypasses is, I think, something really fundamental about the meaning of the country, right? Think of the oath of office the president takes. The president swears to the best of his ability to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. Why is that? Because the Constitution is the country. The United States is not the United States without its system of government. Like, that's what we are. So attempting to overturn the Constitution is an attack on the United States. Trump does not have to seize the Capitol, the Capitol building, the physical building, to be an insurgent. His attack on Congress was more fundamental than that. It was an attempt to render the legislative branch basically meaningless and subservient to the executive. So Trump does not need to declare a breakaway republic. His insurrection is against the very system of government he has sworn to uphold. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right. And I think I have been, you know, I've been very, I would say, cool to these interpretations of the 14th Amendment, just because, you know, I do think that there is something about the American system that's built into the Constitution that is in some ways kind of anti-democratic, right? I mean, there are all of these things about our system of government that are safeguards against majority rule, essentially, right? We have a Senate, we have a electoral college, we, we have a Supreme Court, you know, we have we have all of these ways in which we can protect the Constitution from the will of, of the voters. And I guess, like, looking at the situation that we're in now, and this is, again, coming back to this question of, you know, does Donald Trump represent a unique threat? Um, 
I think Donald Trump actually does represent a unique threat. And um, if you look at the sort of opponents that are arrayed against him and their inability to defeat him in the Republican primary, I, I can't help but feel that, like, if he were removed from the political landscape by some deus ex machina, that, like, I don't know that things would go back to normal, but I think that the temperature would change. Um, now, that's not a constitutional argument for doing it, but um, but I do think that in the context of our Constitution and its ability to tolerate and its flexibility to rule out these questions of the tyranny of majority, I actually think that this is an idea that I could get behind. Lydia, the temperature would change and it would get higher. Yeah. No, I think that's if right. Like, like I don't, I don't want Trump to be the president. The way I'd like that to happen is by him losing another election. I'd much rather he be defeated in the polls than removed by some Deus Ex Machina like this, because people aren't going to sort of, you know, take that. Nor should they. We've we've talked about. We've talked about. Are you about switching on, sides? On the, Are you Ross, switching sides, Carlos? Ross, no, like I, I <laughs> See, started is, off I'm saying that I was, I was very torn wait. about this. Yeah, I was very torn about this. No, but like, here's the thing. So, Ross, you deservedly took a victory lap because the first thing I thought of when I heard of about Colorado was that you had said on the podcast that this was going to happen, and you you were you were poo pooed. Now, we've talked about sort of definitions of democracy on the podcast. Like the rock bottom minimalist notion of democracy is a system that elects its leaders through fair and open elections in which the majority of people are empowered to vote for candidates of their choice, right? When I think of that notion of democracy, I think Trump should absolutely be allowed to run for president. When I think of a liberal democracy, it gets more complicated because liberal democracy is not just voting in elections. It's the protection of basic liberties. It's a strong civil society. It's an independent judiciary. It's robust adherence to the rule of law. We uphold liberal democracy with a constitution. So to me, denying someone the right to run based on a violation of a provision of the constitution does not seem to be anti-democratic if it's clear that the person in question indeed violated that statute. The whole point, as Lydia said, of having a constitution is you set guardrails around democracy to prevent mob rule. So did he incite insurrection in a way that would trigger the 14th Amendment by his actions on January 6th, I kind of believe he did because I watched him do it on live TV and because I read the Gen 6 committee report front to back. But I don't get to decide. If Trump is convicted in the federal January 6th case, I would be far more inclined to consider him ineligible to be on the ballot than I am now. So I'm coming at this from a kind of meaner perspective and looking mostly at the kind of gross practical fallout that we could be looking at. Look, I tend to believe that the Supreme Court is not going to uphold the Colorado decision. And so what my question there is, is the court going to provide any clarity or closure? Are they going to rule broadly or are they going to rule narrowly? My suspicion is that they'll rule narrowly so that he can stay on the ballots, but they won't be the ones calling any questions about whether or not he engaged in an insurrection. The Odds that he is going to be stripped of ballot access in any meaningful states look pretty slim. And so my concern is that what we're teeing up for is a situation where he is going to use this, as he always does, as proof of his victimhood. It's not going to have a practical difference, and it's just going to make his case for him and make it all the uglier and divide the country even more, and convince the tens of millions of people who are teed up to vote for this guy that democracy and the system of American democracy, you know, they shouldn't have faith in it, that it is, you know, under attack uh, just as he has told them it is. Now, that's not a reason for this not to go forward, but it is why I am so very interested in what the Supreme Court how they rule. Again, I don't believe that they're going to support the Colorado decision, but I do believe that there are ways that they could make it more or less toxic. I mean, imagine if the Supreme Court ruled that actually it really is just up to every state secretary of state to decide if someone's guilty of insurrection or not and justified it with some kind of originalist interpretation. Maybe that would be a brilliant going in that that, direction, Ross. No, 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 of course not. Right. But maybe that would be a brilliant originalist reading of what this means. But it would be insane. It would be insane. How long until 
a state Supreme Court or a secretary of state in a red state attempts to take Joe Biden off the ballot right. uh, due to the crisis at the border. Right. right? For, you well, can invoke well, the this, same 14th this, Amendment. And this is where I want to circle back, Carlos, to your argument about the president's constitutional oath, because the reality is that, of course, presidents in large ways and small can be said to violate that oath all the time. Or at the very least, we have constant debates about whether this president or that president has betrayed his oath of office through claiming extraordinary powers against Congress, right? Presidents not named Donald Trump, presidents named George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and for that matter, you know, Lyndon Johnson and FDR and Abraham Lincoln have all claimed extraordinary powers over and against the legislative branch without being guilty of insurrection. The reason there's any case here at all, I think, is that there really was a riot. Trump did not explicitly incite the riot, but clearly encouraged it and liked that it happened. And you could imagine a world where there was evidence that Trump had personally planned the riot and that he really did want them to take Mike Pence hostage and make him vote a certain way. And that kind of would be an actual literal insurrection. But you can't get to that from what he did. What he did was really bad. (laughs) It was really bad. But it was not actually a planned attempt to replace the government of the United States by force. It just was not. Whatever else it was, as bad as it was. And I think that has to be the standard. Does it have to be by force? Well, yes. The the standard is basically it needs to be it needs to be a like Confederate style. No, I mean it could be small. It could be is that no, it could be smaller. I think if Donald Trump had, or not even smaller, it could be a different kind of thing. If Donald Trump had ordered the military to seize the Capitol building and declare him president, that would reasonably count. And what Trump what Trump was trying to machinate himself into some kind of weird 1876-style scenario where Congress would vote him back into the presidency. And that was bad and corrupt, but 1876 was not an insurrection, right? I mean, what we have fundamentally a problem here is the idea that whether or not he participated in an insurrection has not been definitive. That case has not been definitively made to the satisfaction of the majority of American public. And so you have to look, in addition to the legal theory, at the particulars, which is that even with the Colorado case, I think there's a lot of questions about whether they just kind of glossed over that whole, oh, well, he's guilty of insurrection, so he can't be on the ballot, as opposed to going through all of the nitty gritty of whether, you know, of proving that he was guilty of participating in an insurrection. Well, and it's interesting, right, because I think there are sort of two points that that bubble to mind as you're talking, Michelle. One is that, you know, the Times' own polling has shown that if Trump were to be convicted, that it actually could cost him support even among Republicans. Um, So actually being convicted of a crime could be meaningful to his electoral hopes. And the other thing, though, is that the, the qualifications for running for president are laid out in the Constitution. And, you know, you could be in prison. You could be a convicted felon. You could be, you know, any of those things. And Trump can still run. He can still be voted for. I, as, a, as a resident of Florida, if he's a, a convicted felon, he himself might not be able to vote in his state. And that's, to me, like a kind of fascinating paradox of yeah, all of this, any right? any random loser run for a president or even be president. You, you right. can be a complete felonious loser and you can still be present. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a great place to end this part of the conversation. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back to talk about the other news to come this year. There's other news? I know. And we're back. And now we're going to zoom out beyond Trump, thank goodness, and share what other stories could qualify for our 2024 bingo cards. 
So, Michelle, you closed out the year with a delightful column on the best, worst, and weirdest political stories from 2023. Mm -mm. You covered a wild and historic turnover in House leadership, criminal indictments, George Santos. Ah, George. R.I.P. Missed that guy. So what story are you going to be watching most in 2024? Like everybody else, I'll be on the presidential campaign trail of sorts. But I also have a couple of early dramas up on the Hill that I'm looking at. One is I'm interested to see whether Speaker Johnson is going to usher us into a government shutdown. As of right now, the word is that they're making progress on cutting a deal that will extend or avoid having a shutdown based on the stopgap measures they passed late last year. The thing that looks less promising is how they're going to resolve the border crisis tied to aid for Ukraine. The Republicans have shifted the usual drama, which is border security combined with immigration reform generally, and it's now kind of border security tied to money for Ukraine. And that is is a really sticky wicket. The question is, what will the final negotiations look like? You know, how much tougher will asylum standards get? How much will parole issues be changed? There's a lot of different pieces with the border crisis that have to be dealt with in order for this to move forward. And that's not looking so hot right now. Globally, the question of immigration, migration, asylum, all of it is going to be a huge story I'm sure that all of us are going to be paying attention to. How about you, Carlos? What's on your agenda? You know, I'm, I'm sure you'll say I'm playing to type. Um, <laughs> you have some books that or, you're going to read? <laughs> that too, but no. I'm going to be following the economy. Um, no, but, but, but not, but it strikes Ever me the that economist. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fascinating to me that a President Biden who came to office pledging to defend democracy, who has staked his reelection campaign on that same fight, is going to see his election rise and fall based on the strength of the economy and on perceptions of the strength of the economy. So I'll be interested not just in the sort of like indicators sense of the economy, but the way Biden chooses to talk about it and campaign on it. I'm also just interested in how the Republican field does or does not fall in line inevitably behind Trump. I think it'll say a lot about the future of the party. And it just reminds me of that moment when all the Democrats fell in line behind Joe Biden after South Carolina. And I, I wonder when that'll happen precisely on the other side this time. You know, it's the, the Daily did an episode uh, recently about sort of Donald Trump's reelect strategy. And I mean, there was a lot of stuff about his like blood and soil nationalism and uh, echoes of, of Hitlerian language. But there was a moment in there where they played a clip of him talking about mortgage rates and the economy. And as someone who just bought a home and took out a mortgage, I could tell you that the perception that things are really tough because mortgage rates are so much higher than they were just a few years ago. I mean, it does have this kind of like kick you in the guts feeling that can override all of the other economic news. So I think you're right, Carlos, that like that's going to be really interesting to watch this year. And um, housing, mortgage rates, all that kind of stuff is like a it's, it's just going to be a huge thing for everyone's pocketbooks, even bleeding heart liberals like me. <laughs> um, Ross, how about you? What are you watching? I mean, I'm a little worried about the collapse of the American empire in 2024. A little. There's a, a really good piece by a British writer named Aris Rusinos in Unheard called The World Should Fear 2024. And if you want to be super anxious about world affairs, uh, you should read it no, um, because his argument is basically that even just relative – to a year or so ago, American power is just really strained on a lot of fronts. The Ukrainian war seems to be turning back against the Ukrainians. The Israel-Gaza situation does not appear to be likely to be resolved anytime soon with the dangers of a wider war hanging over everything. We can't keep the Red Sea shipping lanes open at the moment because of attacks by the Houthis in Yemen. and. All of these are the kinds of problems that can be managed. We are managing them. I worry about the chaos of an election year basically encouraging revisionist powers to, to sort of roll the dice with China and Taiwan being the big example. I don't think it's super likely, but it's something, yeah, it's something that I worry about. And 
the overall number of pressure points on the American-led world order is going up as we head into what promises to be an exciting domestic political drama. Yeah, I mean, I think the intertwining of the domestic and international is going to be, for me, a big theme, too. I mean, it's striking, right, because the number of elections that are going to be happening this year across the globe is just astonishing. I think it's about 40 percent of the world's population essentially will be will be going to the polls this year in some very, very important countries. And I'll be watching India, obviously. There's going to be very important elections in Europe. And it doesn't sound sexy, but the European Parliament elections, I think, will be a really interesting <laughs> Rorschach test. Super sexy. But, you know, that is the place where I I think of them as like our school board elections where, you know, where like the real sort of like (laughs) narrow cast freak agendas get played out. And so I think it's going to be very interesting to see how that interesting, not not necessarily in a good way. And we have an election in Taiwan. We have an in election a few, in a few it, days, in a few yes, days which I think it's going to be days. it's going to be really really get interesting. It back to Ross's Before point. we go to that, I just want to go to the one thing that I'm very very terrified about that uh, no one has mentioned. But UFOs fits into the theme of Ross. Uh, there's going to be a briefing. We should talk about that. Uh, UFOs, obviously, um, that's is, something is to a, celebrate, not be terrified about. Come on, no, we're, we're, gonna, oh, we're Michelle, coming to the good news. We're Michelle. coming to the good news part. <laughs> it, it could go anyway. But just to, to go back to Ross's doom and gloom about the American led order, I'm a little freaked out about what's happening in Pakistan. Just to remind our listeners, Pakistan is a country with nuclear warheads. It's already been the site of nuclear proliferation. There is a very fragile caretaker government in place there right now. There's an election this year. It is a very, very messy political situation. And they have now the Taliban in Afghanistan breathing down their neck, the viper that the Pakistani government created in order to extend its influence is now coming back to bite them. And we could be facing a very real possibility of a kind of jihadi government having nuclear weapons. So just add that Lydia. to your, your bingo card of things, terrible, terrible things that could happen in 2024. So, uh, but yeah, let's let's come back. Taiwan, China, like that, another, another cheerful possibility. No, I was just going to say that your scenario as well, Lydia, is a great reminder that conflicts and wars don't like wait patiently in line for their turn. Just because we have Ukraine, just because we have Israel and Hamas, doesn't mean that we can't have more. Okay, does anybody have anything optimistic to say? (laughs) Well, sure, it's always the years. No, history is unpredictable, and it's always the years that you expect (laughs) to be terrible that turn out to be actually pretty chill and amazing. And maybe um, that Biden boom is just around the corner. Maybe there'll be peace in Ukraine. Maybe the stalemate will induce an armistice. China doesn't really want to attack Taiwan right now. Come on, right? And I'm, try- I'm struggling to say something optimistic <laughs> about about the Middle East. But, um, you know, God loves us all. How about that? That's the best you got today, Ross? That's Seriously. the best I've got every day, Michelle. I mean, I... My wish on, you know, let's say January 3rd, 2025, is to listen back to this episode and say, thank God, none of those worst case scenarios happened. <laughs> and then and we made penance. it through 2024. <laughs> There's been no nuclear proliferation to a jihadi group. There's been no war between Taiwan and China. But yeah, I think this year is going to be a tough one. And I, I don't know. I'm looking forward to making lots of great podcasts talking about it with all of you. Yes, we can come here and whine about everything as the year goes by. Done. That's good. Okay, let's leave it there. When we come back, hot and cold. Finally, it's time for Hot Cold. And because it's a new year, and we hope that brings new listeners, I'll explain the conceit. (laughs) Every week, one of us shares something. We're into, over, or somewhere in between. So, who's got the hot cold this week? So, I'm going to ring in the new year. And one thing regular listeners know is that we usually don't do the somewhere in between option. We're almost all you know, genuinely hot or genuinely cold. We have opinions. But I I have a lukewarm take. Over the Christmas holiday, my wife and I finished watching The Crown on Netflix. 
And I watch a fair amount of television, but I, I generally have a kind of a pretty high bar for things that I stick with. Like if a show has, you know, one good season and three bad seasons, I'm usually out of there by the end of the first bad season. And I don't watch a lot of shows where I'm like, meh, you know, B minus or something. But I watched the entire run of The Crown. This was a lot a lot of episodes over many years, multiple actresses playing Elizabeth II. And at the end of it, I was like, I'm just incredibly lukewarm about this show. <laughs> were you mad all the way through or did you go up and down and up mm. and down? And I, I mean, there were good episodes. There, I was, there were better episodes and worse episodes. And part of what kept me with it was that the worst episodes were never that bad. And when it turned over to a new episode, often there would be something interesting. And I really, you know, it, it's a good case study in sort of how to how to sort of hook a viewer and hold them for a long period of time without ever sort of fully justifying the <laughs> expense and great acting and so on that was lavished on this story. Did any of you guys watch the show? I haven't finished the last episodes, but I think the thing that kept me coming back is just so nice to look at, you know? like so the, just Well, right. Ravishing, yeah. like the Scottish countryside, the outfits, the things, you know— in my mind, the crown goes down as like, you know, something pretty to look at, uh, learn some fun things in the early episodes, some quite good performances, but ultimately, ultimately kind of a failure. The, the last thing I'll say is just that there is, I think, my lukewarmness reflects sort of the an uncertainty that is connected to the monarchy itself, right? Which is the show is about the survival of the monarchy embodied in this really you know, in certain ways, quite remarkable woman who gave her whole life fully and completely for its survival. But the show itself at the end can't quite decide what was that for. So, right, so maybe, maybe in a sense, the lukewarmness is bound up in the uncertainty about why this archaic thing has been preserved and what its ultimate destiny will be, which, you know, could be the restoration of royal power in the chaos of the collapse of the American empire. And I there know, you have it. I know. King Donald Happy Trump. Happy 2024. Here we go. Oh all connects. Oh, all right, guys. Um, wonderful to see you all again in the new year. And here's to lots of great episodes of Matter of Opinion. Here, here. Welcome back. Here, here. Thanks for joining our conversation. If you liked it, be sure to follow Matter of Opinion on your favorite podcast app. And let us know what big question you think we should think about next by emailing us at matteropinion at nytimes.com. Matter of Opinion is produced by Sophia Alvarez Boyd, Phoebe Lett, and Derek Arthur. It is edited by Allison Bruzek. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Afim Shapiro, Carol Sabaro, Sonia Herrero, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Carol Sabaro. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samilewski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. <laughs> <laughs>